70% is the rest of the staff and the services that go with it. We've had a 293% increase in strategic product absorption since fiscal year 11 in IP office, and a 21% increase in partner satisfaction since uh, fiscal year 10. So, so you can see you're very, very important to us. They asked me to do a little introduction about myself, and as many of you know, I grew up in this business as a channel partner just like you. Uh, three people, $3,000, three credit cards, three mortgages, and I had a very nervous wife. Grew that to about $80 million before we split it into a couple of companies and I decided to come help out of I here. But you might know or not know how I got my entrepreneurial start. So I actually paid my way through college on the seat of a unicycle. Um, this is the world's tallest unicycle, July 15th, 1977, 51 feet high. You know, I learned to ride unicycles in the junior high physical education class. They sort of rented a bunch of unicycles and they said, here, learn to ride. So I did, I liked it, and I decided that I wanted one, but it wasn't anywhere near Christmas or New Year's or uh, Christmas or my birthday. So I uh, decided I'd build one. So I took apart an old bicycle and I welded things back together and I built a six foot unicycle, and then I built a nine foot unicycle, and at some point people thought it was entertaining to watch me ride tall unicycles. So I actually ended up in the entertainment business in college, running around on weekends, um, doing my unicycle act. Um, at some point I wanted to set the world record. And the challenge was I couldn't afford to sort of buy all the things I needed to do to build the unicycle until I actually had a customer. This probably sounds a little like some of the, the deals that you guys sell in your business given the importance of cash flow, right? So I ended up selling the deal. I bought the aluminum to build the unicycle. I taught myself to weld aluminum, built the unicycle, wrote the unicycle, set the world record in two weeks. So I understand what it's like to be an entrepreneur and to have some time pressures to deliver for those customers. Let's get started here. Like the Olympics, we compete in a very aggressive arena and we need to work closely together to win. Let me share with you a little video uh, that we uh, shot in Sochi recently. Roll the video. The Avaya team arrive at the Bolshoi Ice Dome, one of the venues in the Sochi Coastal Cluster. It will host the ice hockey final in what is bound to be a packed and raucous event. Thousands of people and even more mobile devices will be used to communicate the drama unfolding before their eyes. Chief Technology Officer Brett Shockley has to ensure that nothing spoils their entertainment. This will definitely be a social media Olympics. You can imagine that all the participants are going to be sending out their Facebook status updates with pictures uh, of between. Um, you know, there's really on the order probably 100, 120,000 devices that are going to be connected into the wireless network here. Let's go take a closer look. Shockley is used to a challenge like
really tying all the communications together for SOTI. And there's some very unique things that they've asked us to do here. Really, this is the first BYOD or bring your own device on the fix. So if you think about it, we're going to have 5,500 athletes. We're going to have in the neighborhood of 25,000 press. Um, we're going to have all the Olympic officials and, and all the volunteers, 25,000 volunteers. Uh, you can expect that we'll probably have uh, in excess of 100,000 devices that people will be connecting into the wireless network here. And we can't really predict what people are bringing until the data show up. So it creates a pretty big challenge. If you look at the previous Olympics, all of the video that's being uh, uh, brought from all the venues to all the different sites has been done with an overlay cable TV network, if you will, with coax. And this is the first Olympics where we're using IPTV and uh, video multicast to bring over the same network as all the other information is traveling over. If there was an issue, it could take seconds for video to reconverge. So you could literally miss key pieces of information. So there's really new technology that makes it uh, much more reliable and much more appropriate for this type of event. So let's talk about the Olympics by the numbers. 50,000 Ethernet ports to plug network devices into. To be able to accommodate the wireless, we're going to have 2,000 wireless access points spread throughout all the 26 venues. And one of the interesting things about wireless access is it really does have to be everywhere. It's going to be available in the stadiums, um, and it's going to be available on the mountain. The Bolshoi Ice Dome is a place where the dreams of some will be realized and the hopes of others dashed. Whatever the outcome, Brett and the gang believe that they have the technology to record the tears and the triumphs. Here you go. Pretty excited, as you can tell, about the, uh, the Sochi Olympics. Um, it's going to be the first BYOD Olympics. Um, it's going to be very, very interesting. It's actually uh, very much like what we see in the rest of the world. First IP video Olympics, where we're uh, doing uh, video multicast to handle all the video and push it to the 26 venues. And the technology that's allowing that, that's driving this capability, is the Avaya Fabric technology. Our networking technology is absolutely core to what we're doing here. Like this Olympic speed skater, you're going to need to hone the edges of your skates to remain competitive and to remain relevant. To win, we need to take the lead with a winning game plan focused on riding industry trends to deliver meaningful business impact. Providing our customers with clear direction based on products that Avaya has today and our vision for the future. Your success is going to be based on the relevance that you build with your customers. So if we're going to execute on our mission together, we need to be aware of the industry trends that are shaping our environment, have a clear strategy and a role to play. We need to have a perspective on how we're going to execute our journey together, how we're going to overcome the inevitable obstacles in both the short term and the long term as we grow our business with our customers. I'd like to take a look at some industry transitions that are helping us create disruption, that are creating opportunities for new relevance with our customers. So let's take a, a poll. How many of you are carrying two, three, or four devices with you today? Most of the room, right? Well, we're at the point where the number, number of mobile devices this year will exceed the world's population. That's an average of three and a half devices carried by mobile workers. As I mentioned, Sochi's a, a, micro, a microcosm of this with over 150,000 devices likely to show up. But you're wondering, is that relevant? Well, of course it's relevant. It's just like a college or a large enterprise when a new release of a hot new mobile product comes out. All of a sudden, they've got to deal with it. Our customers need us to deliver high-quality, low-cost collaboration solutions that are intuitive, easy to work, easy to manage across mobile, PC, tablet, and room systems. Today, mobility includes video. We're getting close to a billion tablets out there. 40% of our employees are spending more than 20% of their time away from their desks. They're not sitting in the conference room anymore. We're all about mobile. Mobility is all about running on a mobile. It's not just about running on a mobile device. It's about running on a, as a system. So for example, the current release of Avaya Aura supports up to 10 devices, 10 applications or soft clients with uh, one number. So you can literally walk up to your phone, you can walk up to your phone at home, your mobile device, your tablet, 
your PC, your Mac, and it really doesn't matter. You have the full scope of the rich communication collaboration capabilities across those devices. That's an example of what it means to think differently about the applications we're creating to collaborate within the enterprise with our customers, suppliers, and partners. Mobility means also multiple, uh, it's not just multiple device, but it means multiple channels. So we're seeing a rapid increase in the use of multiple channels to communicate with our customers. So we did a survey in the US and the UK, we surveyed end user consumers, and we got some interesting statistics. 78% of the people we surveyed said they wanted multi-channel to communicate um, with the companies they're doing business with. In fact, 50% said they're using multi-channel regularly. Unfortunately, only 17% said that we do this well, and 65% said that they have to start over every time they switch to a new channel. And maybe most importantly, 85% of the people said they would buy more from companies that made it easy to buy. There's a great opportunity in multi-channel. And what about big data? Context, awareness, analytics are coming of age. And it's interesting as you survey IT managers, you see sort of 30% saying big data is a problem. And another 70% see it as an opportunity. We're with them. You know, it's interesting you take a look at the contact center, and uh, even a contact center with a few hundred agents, we figure generates as many as a billion events a day. The biggest customers we have out there, up to a billion events a day. And today, what do we do with that information? Most of it, we just turn into some operational reporting and we throw away the data. Yet, at the same time, these companies are spending millions of dollars doing deep data analytics on point of purchase information, consumer behavior, they're looking at how to data mine all kinds of different sources of information. What about if we brought these two things together? I'll give you an example. My godson works for a consulting company that did a project for one of the large national grocery chains. And he built an application for them that allowed you to walk into the grocery store and push coupons to your iPhone based on the aisle that you were walking down and the product that they thought was most profitable, they wanted to increase the propensity to buy. So millions of dollars on an application like that. Now what about if we could take all that structured and unstructured data in the contact center do speech analytics against all the things people were saying, mine that data and connect it together with the rest of that kind of information. You're going to see a lot of that kind of work happening so that people can fine tune the customer experience, make sure they deliver the right resources to that customer. Big data and analytics is going to be a huge growth area for us. And it's not just for the biggest customers. You're going to see these techniques being applied to call centers with uh, 50 agents, 100 agents. As, we, as you guys all know, even in that size range, people expect the same kinds of capabilities in call center with 1,000 or 2,000 agents or more. Security is a big deal. The threats are not just coming from the outside. In fact, 67% of data breaches are done by insiders. And 70% of the discoveries of those are made by those outside of the organization. So policy-based identi identity management, session order control, there's just a couple of the security applications that you're going to need to get your people to be expert on to make sure that they can do that consulting with the customer for the entire solution. And of course, with all the news in the press, whether it's the NSA Prism program, WikiLeaks, your customers are becoming hyper-aware. They're looking for you to deliver solutions. Cloud is one of the hottest topics that's out there today. 70% of all new applications are going to be running on the cloud. 60% of server work, uh, workloads are going to be virtualized this year. And I think about it this way. Our applications need to be virtualized. They need to run wherever our customers want them to run. If that means it's on the premise in a hosted private cloud, public cloud, uh, or hybrid cloud application, both for the enterprise and mid-market, we need to facilitate that and, and make that available. I know you're all going to have a different play on how you want to do it. Some of you might want to do hosting yourself. Some of you might want to white label a service from us or someone else. Our intent is to make all those different options available. Many of them are available today. In August, we presented our 2014 growth strategy to our board of directors. Since then, we've been rolling out training for all of our employees. And today, I'd like to walk you through that strategy just a bit. Um, 
A bit of a busy slide, but this is a slide that we've been training our employees if they um, pay attention to nothing but this one slide. This is important for them to understand the strategy, be able to communicate to our customers, our partners, um, and the entire ecosystem. Um, we're focused on increasing Avaya's value to customers and partners with an expanded portfolio of differentiated and segment-specific solutions, translating this value into preference by investing to increase sales coverage, establish big friends, and reduce the cost of complexity. So that's sort of the, uh, the overview uh, point, but if you take a look at it, we've got a set of strategic imperatives. Everything you've been hearing at this conference and you'll be hearing from us this year is you're going to be hearing about segments. The large enterprise, the mid-market. Very focused on the way that we go to market from a sales coverage perspective, the alliances that we create, the ecosystem of products that we bring in to work with, the acquisitions that we do. You'll hear us talking a lot about the integrated stack and delivering that complete top to bottom solution. You'll hear us talking about simplifying the customer and the partner experience. We recognize that we've got to be easier to do business with. We recognize that our products need to be simpler to install, especially as we're delivering products into that big market. On the high end, certainly people want to be able to do lots of configuration and customization, but that still doesn't mean they want complexity. We need to continue to battle to drive complexity out of our solutions and make them simpler to implement. Our vision is a little different than you might have heard um, in the past. Preferred provider of open, mobile, enterprise collaboration platforms. We see mobile as being key to everything that we do. Continuing to transform the way we work, leading with a culture of transparency, ethics, and integrity. And something new. You're going to hear me talk today, you're going to hear from Avaya talking about the importance of relevance. New relevance drives growth. Relevance leads to revenue. It's not just about selling the big deal, it's about selling the application to the business that makes you relevant so that you can dramatically grow your business. We'll talk more about that in the uh, presentation today. So, we talked about sort of that core business, the UC Contact Center, um, and services that we're expanding from. The applications area is a key area you heard this week about collaboration environment. That's a key tool for us to be able to really broaden the ecosystem of developers, including all the folks in your companies as well as in your customers, independent uh, software vendors to create applications that can be accessing the rich capabilities of the core of our, app, our, of our platform, um, as well as being able to quickly add value-added applications on top. Flexibility and delivery, cloud, very, very important, multiple delivery models. Video and other new means of improving productivity and networking. And one of the things about networking is, is that when we use networking to deliver the entire stack, simplify the solution and guarantee that that solution is going to work as a complete system, it's a great opportunity to drive larger constructs and greater revenue. Busy chart, a couple of things I wanted to point out for you here. Um, IT spend is shifted. Down here, this is enterprise telephony. It's down there next to PCs, laptops, and printers. This tells you something about where you ought to be spending your time with your salespeople selling to your customers. And yet, on the other hand, they're spending all kinds of money, data analytics, um, software as a service, mobility, security, virtualization, social applications. Great opportunity, great opportunity for us to change the conversation and talk about all the solutions we have that are relevant to those applications. The applications that are being driven by the consumer applications that are coming into the enterprise and driving the way enterprise communicates with customers. Uh, and bringing in a whole next new wave of productivity with these types of tools. We talked a lot about inter integrated stack this week. Think about the integrated stack as sort of fulfilling three promises. An open solution that's fit for purpose and provides real innovation. So we're delivering a complete solution. We're committed to that end to end, simpler to install, simpler to manage, more reliable. But at the same time, we're open at every level in that stack. So our goal is to be able to work with our customers that might already have some level of that stack they want to use. 
They might think somebody else is best agreed in a given place in the stack. That's okay. That doesn't mean we're going to give up on that later. What that means is we will continue to innovate. We will continue to deliver until we have the best agree, until we earn the business at every level of the stack, not because we're locking everybody into the stack. You have some part of this budget. An important part of this is strategic alliances, both through acquisitions as well as um, through our, uh, our partnerships with various companies, large and small, we use these alliances to round out the solution so we can help you deliver a complete solution. The most recent acquisition we did, IT Navigator, very focused on delivering that multi-tenant, multi-user, multi-level multi -level admin that's required for cloud-based applications, as well as the delivery to larger enterprises where they'd like to have each division sort of be able to have control over of their own world. At the end of the day, our relevance is going to be measured by how much we help our customers help their customers. So where are our customers headed next, and how do we play into that? Well, Avaya is a global leader in innovation with almost 6,000 patents. We have 200, last year we had 250 new patents that were granted, and we applied for 500 new ones. That's an order of magnitude greater than many of our competitors. Take a Genesis, for example, with a dozen patents. And it puts us in the same order of magnitude as much, much larger companies that are seen as uh, innovators, like Google. Google, a couple of years ago, was in the 400 patent range. They're up in the 1,000 patent range. We're playing in that same kind of arena. Out of all this innovation, we have some great solutions to offer our customers. And I'd like to talk a little bit about what we're seeing where our customers are looking to move next and some of the solutions that we need to have to get them there. So, of course, we're going to continue with what we're doing with SIP-based applications and session management. It's a great platform to grow from. It allows us to bring a lot of new technologies and a lot of new applications in. The work we've done with the collaboration environment starts to make these core Aura services and development tools available so that we can bring in developers that don't have to have specialized CTI programming knowledge the things they're learning in college and computer science and job skills, etc., all apply. We believe this is a big opportunity to enable growth in a, range of, a whole new range of applications for uh, whether they're developed by our customers, our partners, or by a buyer. IP Office 9.0, you've been hearing a lot about that this week. A great set of new applications for the mid market, scaling it up. Um, Mark Monday's going to talk in more detail about that in just a minute. But we've really been focused on growing IP Office up and really delivering a complete, robust solution for the mid-market. And if you think about it, we're sort of coming from the top of the market down with Aura, and we're coming from the bottom of the market up with IP Office. And it really gives you a lot of choices in terms of the kinds of solutions you want to deliver based on what your customer needs. Mobile video is huge. We all know 17 to 20 percent of uh, conference, video conference rooms, uh, or 17 to 20 percent of the time video conference rooms are actually being used. The rest of the time they're empty because we're mobile, we're out running around. Um, they're, they need to be mobile if they're going to do video. And what we've been finding is if, if we go in and we talk to customers about the same old video story, they're sort of tired of video conference rooms because they spend a lot of money and they're hitting that 17 percent utilization number. The key is to get in there and do the demo, show them how easy it is. We recently in our competitive war room did a comparison of getting Scopia versus Polycom up and running. Um, so you send somebody an invite and say, hey, join me in this meeting. And Scopia is less than a minute. In Polycom, it's seven minutes and you have to reboot your computer. Do that demo and you will change the perspective of your customers. I recently did one of these demos for the CIO of a large computer manufacturer. And he went home and he canceled a 1,500-seat order with Polycom. And we're now putting together a 1,500-seat order, order for the Bioscopia solutions. <laughs> Another good example of a use case that you can sell is looking at places where there's a lot of video cameras. And certainly, video cameras are proliferating faster than people these days. Um, here's an example in the city of Santa Clara. Traditional um, video multicast solution, lots of VLAN set up, you know, one of those uh, uh, legacy networking carriers out there. And uh, they had to have a college kid that uh, they hired that came in every morning at 7 in the morning to reboot the video because basically uh, multicast had lost its mind and they 
couldn't figure out how to diagnose it. Well, this was affecting the traffic in Santa Clara because they were using video multicast to be able to control the cameras. We went in and replaced this technology with our fabric technology. It's now been up for several months. It's never been down at all. That poor college kid had to find a new role to play in the city of Santa Clara. This is a great opportunity, and as you see, Calico, they're one of the big uh, video surveillance players out there. Very excited about what they're seeing. It's a great opportunity for you to go after uh, a new use case that is really something where we can do something special with our fabric technology. The video multicast is not just in security, it's all over the place. Uh, so this is one of those great insertion points that you can use. Multi-channel customer experience, growing like crazy. We've worked hard to make sure that there's a great path for elite to multi-channel, with elite multi-channel. Um, we have the Avaya Aura uh, contact center solution. We're very focused on a whole set of new capabilities around multi-channel. When I talk to some of our larger customers, it's really interesting. I was at a big bank in New York recently, and they told me that they had 86% containment in the IVR, which is great. The 14% that made it out of the IVR, um, that was 200 million calls a year to them, so obviously a lot of calls. Um, but what they said is they absolutely knew nothing about what happened when somebody was at a website that had a failed transaction or a mobile application that had a failed transaction. And if they could tie those together, then their relevance in the company goes up dramatically and the experience that they deliver to their customers changes. We've done this ourselves inside of Avaya. So if you take a look at our customer support uh, website, we've done a number of things. We went in and we wanted to change the game, we wanted to upgrade the technology that we were putting in our own stuff. We went in, we spent millions of dollars upgrading our website, and what do you think happened? Did we get a lot of new people going to the website? Didn't change at all. Because we had trained people to go to our 800 number. Well, so then we went to our agents and said, we have a great script for you to read, and what the script says is, uh, the next time you have a problem, start with the website first. Do you think the agents read the script? And they were a little concerned about telling people to go to the website for self service. So we put in our speech analytics application. We listened to what the agents were saying and made sure they were saying what they were supposed to say. Within two weeks, we had 100% compliance on reading the script. And we found a dozen people that were demonstrating by their behavior that they no longer wanted to work at Avaya. So we helped them out the door, and the employee satisfaction actually went up by 18%. Because they knew who all the good people were. They knew who the bad people were. They couldn't understand why management uh, had to see that, right? So then we had them help us with the re-engineering of the contact center and what we were doing at the website. So now what happens is you come into the website and you do self-service. You go from there to, gee, I'd like to chat with the knowledge base. You can do an automated chat with the knowledge base. The agents are contributing 1,600 new cases a month to the knowledge base, so solutions to problems are actually there. The, incentive, the agents are incented to publish those use cases or those solutions within 30 minutes of when they discover them. Now let's say that the answer isn't in the knowledge base and you use a human being. You need a human being. You can escalate to the human being via chat. You can escalate from there to voice. And by the end of this year, you'll be able to escalate the video. And that's all being done through the browser. And that's a use case that I think uh, many, many customers are going to want to see. This is a great story. There's a lot more statistics about it. We've got a white paper on it. This is a story that I would encourage you to have your sales teams learn, practice, and tell your customers. I've seen people completely change the way they look at us when we talk to the line of business and we talk to this story. We've reduced our uh, number of phone calls by close to 60%. We've increased um, our debt promoter score by over 60%. We've got dramatic statistics as part of this story that uh, demonstrate the success that we've delivered, the relevance that we've created there. What I'd like to do next is I'd like to invite Amir and Meet up on stage to help me out with a, a multi-channel customer experience demo. Amir, hey. I'm great. It's good to see you. So, boy, uh, it was kind of late night last night, huh? It was a little late, yes. I heard there was a few uh, few folks that made it over to Coco Bongo. Uh, I'm not sure. I can neither confirm nor deny that. All right. Well, you know, I, for me, I think I need a cup of coffee to wake up. Can I uh, interest you in a cup of coffee? Fantastic. Let's I've, I've got this new coffee maker that I got. It's a compresso machine. And it's got this fancy feature that it's got this built-in conical bird grinder. Nothing but the best of the CTO of the client. Exactly. Wow. And we've got my favorite Jamaican beans. Jamaican one. I love it. All right. So um, I'll just press the button. 
here and we'll, uh, we'll grind some beans. Make some coffee. Yeah. All right. That didn't sound very good. No, I think something must be wrong with this new coffee maker. No, when did you get this? I just got it. You know, so I, I, I think I we probably should call them and see if we can get it. Okay, hang on a second. I see a QR code over here, Brad. Okay, so uh, let's, let's let's give that QR code a try and see what uh, see what happens. So uh, there we go. So here we are. We're at the Williams and Sedona website. Uh, Sedona. Okay. And uh, they've got the right machine. That's because I registered. You registered. They know who you are. That's pretty impressive. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, they got this cool thing here called Ask the Donna. Ask the Donna. Sedona Donna. Ask the Donna. Kind of cute. So uh, yeah, I hear she gets a lot of proposals for marriage. Wow. Okay. Uh, so let's ask her a question. We'll say hi. And uh, how can I help you today? Okay. Um, problem. Sorry to hear that. Um, is this the compressor for So she knows exactly which model you have because you've registered. That's fantastic. So, yes, it is. I okay. described the problem. Would you describe that problem? Uh, weird noise. Nasty. Distort, disturbing noise, right? <laughs> okay. So we hear awkward sounds. Um, could be a number of reasons. It's coming from the conical bird grinder. I yes. think so. I think so. Um, containers filled with beans. It is. I had my bean counter so jacket. It's a smart coffee machine. Um, so, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's see. Yes, 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 yes. Let's try the obvious. Let's bring a line expert to help diagnose it. So, click to start okay. video so, chat. Let's so, what we're going to do here, like, we all multitask. I have as I know our channel partners always multitask. So, uh, of course, everyone knows me. I'm, I'm a, you know, a good buy in from Toronto. You know, I play hockey, I take wrist shots, I, I, I have Tim Hortons coffee, although I like the Jamaican. But today, you guys have to work with me, because I'm going to try to impersonate an Indian call center maker. Now, now, I know I don't look the part, I know I don't look the part, but just please, if you will, just work with me. I'm going to be an Indian call center maker. Just answer the damn phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hello, Mr. Shotley, sir. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. It's good to see you. And what's your name? My name is Ali. It's Alistair Forsyth. Alistair Forsyth. And where are you from? I'm from De Delaware. I'm from Delaware. Delaware. Yeah, I've been to Delaware. There's a great seafood restaurant there. Frank Seafood down by the wharf. Ah, Frank, let me know. I am vegetarian, so I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> okay. Say, I'm having a problem with my, uh, with my coffee grinder. Okay, could I, uh, could I understand, could I hear it? Uh, I'd like to hear it. Okay, well, let me, uh, let me come over here and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll press the button. Oh, that's very bad. Very bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I may know the problem. Could it be seen? Uh, sure, let me see if we can uh, get it into the picture here. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. I see a very, very bad problem. Sir, you have too many beans in your bag. Too many beans in my room. Please extract some of those beans. Okay, I'll get rid of some of the beans. We'll throw them in there, okay? All right. Let's try it now, sir. All right, we'll press the button again. Absolutely. We 
we've got customers we've been working with um, all over the world. Um, down in uh, Brazil, um, we're doing a uh, project to transform them from where they're at today to our next generation contact tech center technology based on our data grid technology, being yeah. an example. Um, I was recently meeting with a large healthcare provider in the U.S. Someone who's figured out how to make money off of Obamacare. Fantastic. And uh, they're, uh, they're actually, uh, one of the things they told me is that at the same time they're transforming to all this next-gen technology with us, they told us that we were the only IT vendor they had that had been, to, had been up for 53 weeks without a single moment of downtime. Fantastic. So this combination of the reliability to deliver the solution while renovating is a big deal. Mission critical collaboration. Well, you know, on that note, I want to say, and I want to encourage and appeal to all our channel partners in the audience, if you have not yet had a chance, please take a walk over to the Innovation Lounge. We have the complete stack on display there. We've got SME, we've got video, call center, we've got UC. Uh, Brett had talked about IT Navigator. You can actually see it in action. And what I encourage you all to do is take a walk and talk to the experts. We hand selected the folks that are there. They know the technology. They can talk about the value prop and internalize it and then take that message to your customer. Now we've got how a 40% greater share in, in uh, the call center. Those are huge. They, they're ready. Well over 70% of the large call centers. Fantastic. Well over 70%. Let's let's bring in the web chat. Let's bring in the live agents. Let's bring enhanced customer experience to them. Please take a walk down to the innovation lounge when you get time. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Brett. Thanks. All right. So if we can get the PowerPoint back on the slides up here. Oh, that'd be good. Excellent. So, some of the other things happening in the contact center, you heard me talk earlier about the speech and call flow analytics, a key part of what we did to change the game inside the Avaya contact center. This technology is being used in a lot of places. The screenshots from the project we did for the BBC, so that instead of one, one guy that had been there 50 years being able to find a quote of Winston Churchill, um, speaking on the radio, 12,000 people can now go and do a query and, and uh, find anything that they want to be able to find. Take a look at contact center applications like we talked about with Mike Runda's example in our contact centers. The ability to make sure that people are saying what they're supposed to say, regulatory compliance, quality control, making sure that they're following the script that we want to follow. Um, market research. We worked with a large consumer products company recently that had years worth of focus groups that they had done. And they hire a new product manager to tell them to listen to the focus groups. How many of you think actually did that? Well, now if you go data mine this information, a great source of new marketing intelligence. Think about Denver Motor Score. What if I could tell you for every single call whether that customer was a net promoter or a net detractor against each of the call types on that call? You can roll that up and you can start to tell the CEO what the net promoter score was doing, how it was trending on a day-by-day -day basis as opposed to uh, twice a year, four times a year. You can basically see what's happening every day. And you can see the agents that are great at this call type but not so good at that call type. You can use it for training, you can use it to change the game. Call flow analytics. This is an easy one. This is one you can go into your existing customers with CMS install, plug this in, suck the data out of the CMS, and you can automatically see where all the calls are going. You can see all the places that aren't being used anymore when people are too afraid to clean up the system and take them out. You can fine tune the experience by seeing this. Very easy to put in. One of these great applications to change the way you perceive the relevance in a lot of customers. So let me give you perspective. As we continue our transformational journey into a software and a services company, we need to make a plan. We need to train, prepare for our journey, and be ready to overcome any obstacle. I'd like to share with you a very personal sense of what it's like to push the limit at the top of the mountain, and why it's so important to do the training, the planning, and reduce the risk, increase our probability of reaching the summit. The next story that I'm going to talk about is, uh, is very personal. I don't know if the, uh, they got, I saw something up here, they told me they don't have the video, is that right? Okay, I'll just talk, I'll talk the story. This is a story of uh, my son, actually. Um, he was 19 years old. Um, he was down in Argentina. He was climbing Mount Aconcagua. 28,200 feet, just short of the summit. And he came, he was climbing by himself, he was doing it solo, and he came across somebody laying on the side of the trail, barely alive. 
He'd been there for several days, couldn't speak rationally, didn't speak English. My son spent the day saving his life instead of making it the last couple hundred feet to the top of the mountain. Spent the day on that satellite phone, getting rescue services organized. Uh, got out of the stove, heated the water, heated the hot drinks, started to get some warm liquids into that person. Um, I got a call from my son about eight hours later um, after he made the decision to not go the last couple hundred feet to the top and instead head back down to my camp. You know, it's that call that parents always sort of uh, um, really uh, hate it's, uh, when it starts with, I'm okay, but. And uh, he told me about um, the decision he made, how he'd spent the day doing this. Satellite phone batteries are almost dead. I'll call you when I get down. We didn't hear from him for three days. So after that experience, um, we talked a lot about preparation, planning, how important it is to make sure you're ready to overcome any obstacle. One of the things that he told me is when you're at that altitude, you think you're thinking clearly, but your brain's not working right. So you better have thought through the scenarios, you better plan for them, you better be ready to overcome the obstacles, just like the obstacles you run into every day in your business. So about six months later, um, Alex and one of his friends um, climbed Denali. You know, in this uh, in this story, basically, they did get prepared. They spent a lot of time uh, getting ready. They packed 30 days worth of food, even though the trip was only supposed to take 21 days. It meant they had more weight to carry, but they're young and they're strong. Um, they spent time the entire time crossing glaciers, crevasses. You've got to be prepared for all the right kinds of contingencies. One of the interesting things that happened is when they got to uh, 14,000 feet, they ran into a situation where they didn't like the way the weather looked. Every other team that showed up at the camp at 14,000 feet that day kept going. They went to 17,000 feet. That night, the weather came in, and there was 60 to 100 mile an hour winds for two weeks. So while Alex and his friend were basically hunkered down, um, uh, having uh, entertaining visits with the other people at that camp, the other people that came in that day had gone up to 17,000 feet, and they were going outside their tent every few hours to stake their tent back down. And at the end of two weeks, the weather looked like this. And Alex and his buddy were able to uh, have a clear day to go to the summit. These people that had sort of rushed ahead, had to work the plan, had really taken care of the contingencies. They were coming back down, medical evacuations. Uh, uh, their trip was spoiled. Whereas he was able to get to the summit and uh, successfully do a handstand on the top. Great, great weather, they spent an hour up there. So very, very successful. But then, you know, you talk about getting to the top. Getting to the top, you would tell you, is optional. And getting to the bottom is mandatory. So um, now that weather that was at the top had started to settle back in. They were heard on the radio. They basically had a 24-hour uh, a window before they were going to be closing down that runway at the base camp. And it would be another week before you could get off the mountains. The people that made it to the top that day, they spent the next 24 hours in a race to be one of the two or three teams that were going to be able to get one of the planes out that day. So this is a picture of Alex and his friend. About 24 hours, uh, or a picture of Alex about 24 hour, hours later, um, he's at the base of uh, Heartbreak Hill, which is the last couple hundred yards before you get to the base camp, which is straight back up again. They've been leaping across crevasses, running to stay ahead of the other group. And uh, in this picture right near the top of that mountain, he fell into a crevasse. And fortunately it was a narrow crevasse, so his feet were dangling in space, but he was jammed into the crevasse. His buddy had the other end of the rope, he was safe. Um, but uh, he heard the other groups behind him coming after him. His competition wanted to get there first. They wanted to get the seat of, win that seat in the airplane. So he's with his ice axe, he's crawling out of the uh, crevasse. They made it the last couple hundred yards, and uh, they caught the plane and made it successfully back. So, you know, one of the things that I, I think is important about the story is it's a lot like the, the, the kinds of adventures sometimes that we have with customers. Amazing obstacles we have to overcome. People telling us no, people tell us we're not relevant. In this case, we've given the business to the competition. How do you overcome that? How do you change the game? Well, let me tell you, success favors the prepared. And that, I think, is a very relevant example in terms of how mountain climbing can be a lot like what we do every day. 
So I'd like to talk a little bit about how we change the conversation. And to do that, I'd like to bring up several partners from InSource, Mike Lohr from Optus Will Gentry, and from Unity, Randy Berger. Uh, Berger, I'd like to have you come join me up on stage here. Thank you. 